Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher currently dealing with some illness and some allergies, but welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. Did you know democracy actually sucks? That's what the founder of philosophy, Mr. Socrates said, but why does it suck? Well, let's hear about it. All right, this video is coming from the School of Life, and the video is simply called Why Socrates Hated Democracy. So let's see what this video has to say why, and I'm gonna add my own thoughts too. Our original video link is down below. Make sure to check that out and let's get started. All right, this is definitely one of those videos I'm gonna wanna see your feedback down in the comments, talking about maybe democracy with its pros or cons, alternatives. Is this the best system that we have here? What should it look like? There's a lot of detail in a conversation about this. So let's get some feedback down in the comments. Okay, here we go. So this is a short, only four, uh, 20. We're used to thinking very highly of democracy, and by extension, of ancient Athens, the civilization that gave rise to it. The Parthenon has become almost a byword for democratic values, which is why so many leaders of democracies like to be photographed there. <laughs> Even though that building had nothing to do with that, it was a temple to Athena. It's therefore very striking to discover that one of ancient Greece's greatest achievements, philosophy, was highly suspicious of its other achievement, so democracy. Chris. The founding father of Greek philosophy, Socrates, is portrayed in the dialogues of Plato as hugely pessimistic about the whole business of democracy. By the way, basically everything we know about Socrates comes from Plato. Socrates was not the writer, the academic that way that like Plato um, and then Aristotle was after him. He was the guy out in the streets, in the market, in the agora. That's really what you should be taking a picture uh, with, with Athenian democracy in front of is the the downtown bustling part where he would go and talk to people and um, get people questioning themselves. Probably heard of the Socratic method where you pose a series of questions that really is supposed to get you to question your own kind of beliefs and test them, put them through the ringer. So anyway. In book six of the Republic, Plato describes Socrates falling into conversation with a character called Adimantus and trying to get him to see the flaws of democracy by comparing a society to a ship. Mm -hmm. If you were heading out on a journey by sea, asks Socrates, who would you ideally want deciding who was in charge of the vessel? Just anyone or people educated in the rules and demands of seafaring? The latter, of course, says Adimantus. So. so why then, responds Socrates, do we keep thinking that any old person should be fit to judge who should be the ruler of a country? So right away with that story, what do you think about that? Do you think that is a good analogy, the, you know, the ship captain mentality? It, it obviously puts a stress if you're going to, you know, for some reason vote who's going to, you know, uh, captain the ship, that people would have the sense to know the criteria for a, you know, someone to, 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 you know, control the ship, right? So does that apply to democracy and to voting? Let's see his connection here. Socrates' point is that voting in an election is a skill, not a random intuition. And like any skill, it needs to be taught systematically to people. Letting the citizenry vote without an education is as irresponsible as putting them in charge of a trireme sailing to Samos in a storm. Socrates was to have first-hand catastrophic experience of the foolishness of voters. In 399 BC, the philosopher was put on trial on trumped-up charges of corrupting the youth of Athens. A jury of 500 Athenians was invited to weigh up the case and decided by a narrow margin that the philosopher was guilty. You know, by the way, this was the moment when Plato, you know, his understudy there, uh, lost his faith in democracy because he's like this wise person that makes all these great points. Right. And a lot of people would agree with as far as the rationality of it has been killed by the democratic process. Democracy killed what he believed was the wisest person in all of Athens. And that's where when you when you look at Republic. Um, Plato's thing is, you know, it, it's about philosopher kings. He pr proposes a government run by philosopher kings, basically meaning wise and educated leaders, right? That's what it should kind of be promoted with. So anyway. He was put to death by Hemlock in a process which is, for thinking people, every bit as tragic as Jesus's condemnation has been for Christians. 
Crucially, Socrates, Socrates the was not Jesus. elitist in the normal or sense. The first he didn't believe that a narrow few should only ever vote. He did, however, insist that only those who had thought about issues rationally and deeply should be let near a vote. This is where when I've, I've had these conversations with students and, and stuff like that and just just asking them, like, like you know, what you think, because we've had this, you know, in classes and discussions and then people be like, yeah, I mean, you know, people should be educated and, you know, all the vote. And then it, then it's and then it gets problematic. Right. Then it's like, OK, well, what how how are people going to be able to show demonstration of their knowledge of and it's not just necessarily electing people, but. Uh, provisions or, or not provision um, like uh, propositions to and new um, um, new new laws and things like that things that get on the ballot where it's like you have the chance to vote on some kind of initiative or a law but don't have to demonstrate any knowledge of that law you can just boop, mark a checkbox and then your decision is equally as weighted as somebody that may be an expert on said you know decision so, you know, people will be like, yeah, I mean, that's that's not really, I guess, good or something like that. Then it becomes sti uh, kind of sticky because then it's like, well, how you do how do you demonstrate how, how can you you know demonstrate that? Um, and then you get into some stickier things, too, about uh, access to education in the early United States um, or actually, especially after the Civil War with some of the Jim Crow laws, you had literacy tests, right? Literacy tests, because the idea that a lot of Southerners were you know, trying to uh, promote was, hey, you should be able to be literate and therefore, you know, educated to be able to vote. But then what ended up happening is it was disproportionately affecting um, freed or ancestors of, of slaves, of enslaved people in the United States. So it became very racially tilted that way. All right. Then the other, the other thing was um, if you're going to do like some kind of academic test, what decides or who decides what the barometer is who decides what should be on that and that inherent of itself could be problematic as well we have forgotten this distinction between an intellectual democracy and a democracy by birthright we have given the vote to all without connecting it to wisdom and socrates knew exactly where that would lead to a system the greeks feared above all demagoguery oh my god yeah ancient Demagog. athens had painfully just somebody that becomes popular by a populist decision somebody that again just is good at getting support but not necessarily maybe knowledgeable of the issues or skilled in any way but just popular and can become very powerful um in that in that respect so anyway that usually often with the end of those conversations i was telling you about about what to do about you know, making sure if you have a democracy that people aren't, you know, intelligent enough to make decisions is education, giving as much educational opportunities to as many people as possible, quality education. And then there you hope you have a good enough baseline of an educated populace that can make decisions. Experience of demagogues, for example, the louche figure of Alcibiades, a rich, charismatic, yep. smooth talking, wealthy man who eroded basic freedoms and helped to push Athens to its disastrous military adventures in Sicily. Socrates knew Plato talks about him a lot, Alcibiades, but yeah, he's like, he is everything wrong with the democracy, right? Because he was, you know, basically a demagogue that way, not popular that way. That would necessarily, we thought demonstrating the skill to be able to do, be a good leader, but was nevertheless popular. He's wealthy and influential that way. How easily people seeking election could exploit our desire for easy answers. He asked us to imagine an election debate between two candidates, one who was like a doctor and the other who was like a sweet shop owner. The sweet shop owner would say of his rival, look, this person here has worked many evils on you. He hurts you, gives you bitter potions and tells you not to eat and drink whatever you like. I'm going to say it, but I shouldn't. Don't look at the guy, the picture in the top. This is why he's saying... This candy shop guy is saying, you don't like doctors. Look what that's going on up there. But this story is actually a really famous one. I'm going to run it back. Um, and what I actually want, want you to, because it's a story I'm thinking of, is to, to, see, to, to see if you agree that elections are exactly the story of the doctor versus the candy sh uh, shop owner. 
between two you candidates. You think this is one who was like a doctor viable. and the other who was like a, a sweet shop owner. As a comparison. The sweet shop owner would say of his rival, look, this person look here has worked many evils on you. He hurts you, <laughs> gives you bitter potions and tells you not to eat and drink whatever you like. He'll never serve you feasts of many and varied pleasant things like I will. Mm. Socrates asks us to consider the audience's response. Do you think the doctor would be able to reply effectively? The true answer, I cause you trouble and go against your desires in order to help you, would cause an uproar among the voters. Don't you think? It's like, oh, you think you know better than me kind of thing? Well, <laughs> yes, the doctor knows better than you about practicing. And yes, it may be painful and something not desirable, but he's the one that is the expert, right? Think? We have forgotten all about Socrates' salient warnings against democracy. We have preferred to think of democracy as an unambiguous good rather than as something that is only ever as effective as the education system that surrounds it. That is probably the conclusion I've seen with, with people that say is the most important thing to make democracy the best system that we can possibly have an educated class, but then at the same time, that becomes debatable, right? You know how many different people have different ideas about what should be in a school and what should be taught in a school? It's just as much as, as, as it's as much a debate as anything else. You see it in education right now, right? As a result, we have elected many sweet shop owners and very oh. few doctors. Ooh, this guy is actually coming to a conclusion, his own conclusion. Okay, what do you think we've elected more, the doctor or the sweet shop owner? Let me know down below, and here's my final thoughts. All right, this dialogue is something, it's, it's amazing because this has gone on for over, you know, 2,000 years, right? That's, I mean, it's longer than 2,000 years since Socrates was around. And he was around, you know, near this, this about 50-year period of this Athenian golden age of democracy. And by the way, not a lot of people know that. Athens has mostly not ever been democratic. And it really was for mostly it kind of in a lot of ways kind of starts in a way with like the Persian Wars where there was actually vote into um, into, you know, do you fight or surrender kind of thing. And that kind of carried into the interwar period. It was only about a 50 year period that Athenian democracy, as we usually talk about, actually existed before it collapsed under power struggles and self-serving upper classes and and um, all kinds of disputes. Here's something to think about with Athenian democracy too. Do you know how many people could actually vote that lived in Athens? It's about 15%. Okay, there's a lot of stipulations. Uh, it was male, okay, it'd be male. You'd be 30, 30 years old. Um, you had to be born in Athens. And you also had to, of course, be a, like a freed person because about a third of Athens was slaves. And a huge percentage of Athens was foreigners because it was a trade city. So in the end, about 15% of people were actually allowed to vote. And uh, there's actually an activity to in our class where we, uh, we do a debate and given some documents kind of and, and given some documents and, and some stats about that. And that's some of the stuff that gets brought up. And the students kind of have to come to a conclusion about, you know, was should should Athens really be considered a democratic society? And there's arguments people make on all different sides because the people, some people right away off the, off the bat would be like 15% of the people there could vote. No way are they democratic. But then usually the counter arguments would come in and people bring in the stats would be like, okay, well, who's excluded? Okay. Women, foreigners, and slaves. So they would try to make that argument where they would say, well, the man is the leader of the household and he's the one that also has been educated the most. And that's a different thing because education was more plentiful for, for men there. But they represent the whole whole household, so you've got you know that argument. And then the foreigner argument was that Athe Athe um, in Athens, our, our foreigners, again, who are there largely probably because they come over for trade or something like that, will they have the best interests of Athens at heart? And then people with slaves would say, well, slaves have a very different set of ambitions and things that they would hope for, which would come in contrast to their whole system, that, you know, largely use slavery. So that would not be a good thing. So anyway, it's, it makes for a really good argument in classes. And if you're a teacher, um, I would suggest doing that. Just just look up, maybe Google just um, like Athenian democracy debate. And it's a pretty good one. It's actually uh, one I, I really enjoy seeing and not not involving myself at all. Just say, hey, here's some documents and uh, separate some people into different groups and then 
try their best to make arguments and come to final decisions. So, all right. Again, thank you. I think this is a great question. Thank you for being here. If you've stuck with me this long, I'd love to know what you think about this whole democracy pros and cons and how do you make it work the best way that you can. Let me know down below. All right. And with that, we'll see you all next time. Bye.